turn over after you do that. Sure. Okay. I think I did it. Yes, I did. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're going to give everyone just another moment to join and then we'll get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to give it one more moment for people to join the line and then we'll get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the June National Farm to School Network Trending Topics webinar, How to Get Involved in Federal Policy. My name is Lacey Stevens. I'm a program manager with the National Farm to School Network. And just a few questions, um, just a few uh, items for review before we get started, some housekeeping. This webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing in the National Farm to School Network resource database. You'll also receive a link to access uh, the recording as well as any resources shared by our speakers in that follow-up email. All attendees right now are in listen-only mode, so as you have questions, please feel free to enter those questions into the chat box in your control panel, and we will have plenty of time for question and answers with our presenters at the end of the session. So as you have any issues along with those questions, please feel free to enter those in the control panel as well. With that, I'd like to turn it over to our presenters to take it away. Sorry about that. I had a little bit of technical difficulty. So um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, our present. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So um, I'm one of your presenters today. Um, again, thanks for joining. My name is Chloe Marshall. I'm the policy specialist with the National Farm to School Network. And hey, y'all, this is Sarah Hackney, the grassroots director with the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition in Washington, D.C. And we're here to talk about the child nutrition reauthorization. But before we get into that, I just want to note a couple of uh, announcements just so you can have them um, before we hop off the call today. Uh, so in July, uh, National Farm to School Network will be hosting our trending topics webinar, um, Farm to Early Care and Education State Strategic Planning. That'll be on Thursday, July 11th, from uh, starting at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, just to note, the times are Eastern on these notes. Um, and then in August, we'll be hosting a trending topics webinar on state local purchasing for incentive bills. Um, and that'll be on Thursday, August 1st at 1 p.m. again, Eastern time. Registration links for both of those will be shared in the follow-up email. So stay tuned for that. Oh, wrong slide, okay. And then the upcoming events to share, we have our National Farm to Cafeteria Conference that we hope you'll be able to join in April 2020. Um, that'll be in Albuquerque, New Mexico this year. And then uh, our National Farm to School Month uh, will be in October, as it is every year. <laughs> so you can find out more at farmtoschool.org. Again, we'll be sharing more information via email uh, in the follow-up. So a little bit about uh, the National Farm to School Network, in case you're not too familiar with us. Um, we are a network of more than 20,000 members uh, with core and supporting partners, nearly 200 of them, that are leading the farm to school and farm to early care and education efforts at the state level. We also are made up of our national staff, um, myself, I'm based in Washington, DC, um, others across the country, and our advisory board. Um, we go. So our core functions as a network include information where we're connecting people to resources and um, research. Uh, we are a hub for networking where we're connecting people to other people. And finally, what's happening right now is we're a hub for advocacy where we're connecting people to policy so that uh, our good folks can learn how to really advance farm to school in a way that embeds it into institutions and our systems. So why Farm to School? We call it our triple win. It's uh, farmers win, kids win, and communities win. Um, kids are learning great healthy habits. Farmers are reinvesting into their communities and communities are reaping the benefits of children learning and farmers thriving. 
So what is Farm to School? If you're not, um, <clears throat> excuse me, terribly familiar right now, there's three core elements that are included. We don't like to define it as one particular program or activity, but really these three pillars, which are school gardens, local procurement, and education. And we also like to talk about farm to early care and education. Um, it has the same elements of farm to school, that being the local procurement, the school gardens, and the um, uh, food and agriculture and nutrition and education piece. But um, early care and education, it's applied for, some, we're now applying it to settings for children ages zero to five. So uh, listed on the slide here, I won't read them all off, but it's more than just preschools that um, are attached to schools, but we're talking about child care centers, um, Head Start, it could be, it could include programs in K-12 districts, but a host of other um, early care settings as well. And why we do farm to ECE and why we have that particular focus, uh, it's because it really relates to children's health and wellness and how they're able to advance in life. So children learning early on those healthy habits are their healthy habits for life at that point. Um, it's also an opportunity for experiential learning where kids are learning uh, with, when they're touching and playing and really hands-on uh, way of learning that's natural to that uh, age group. And finally, we find that families and communities are really engaged at this point in a child's life um, than being so small and so vulnerable. So taking advantage of that and really uh, helping parents and communities and families uh, engage in the child's life and be involved in a way that, that creates lasting impact on the child's health and wellness and their learning. Right on. Hey, everybody. This is Sarah with NSAC. Um, for anybody who's not familiar, I'll just give you a, a quick hello about who we are and what we do. And then we are going to jump right into the meat of the webinar. Um, so just real quick, who is NSAC? And where, what are we talking about Farm to School for here today? We are a DC-based national coalition made up of just about 130 organizations all around the country working to build a more sustainable food and farm future. We focus on building grassroots power for our movement and achieving policy reform at the federal level. The National Farm to School Network is a member of NSAC, as are several of NFSN's core partners around the country. Awesome. How do we do our work? So our policy ideas and our grassroots campaigns all come from the ground up. It starts with farmers, communities, individuals, stakeholders, folks like you doing the work in the field. Folks like you bring their concerns, their ideas, their needs with regards to policy to our member organizations. Um, our members in turn bring those concerns and ideas to our shared table. And as a coalition, we decide together um, how we wanna win and make the improvements that folks need on the ground. We take a systems approach, which means we work on a whole host of issues related to food and farms. So that's organics, local food systems, um, access to land, food safety, conservation, racial equity in the food system, and so much more. Farm to school and how it connects back to that bigger system is very much a part of our work um, and our policy efforts. And we're super pleased to be collaborating with the National Farm to School Network on efforts around farm to school in the Child Nutrition Act. And with that, I will hand it back over to Chloe to kind of jump us right in. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. So um, we're going to dive right into it. Neck deep. Hope you all are ready and have your floaties today. So um, the first thing we want to really talk about is a kind of a policy 101 um, and give you a brief primer on how uh, the policy cycle works. So um, first off, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this is in reference to federal policy, but at the state level, it's fairly similar, um, except for a few differences in structure and formal processes, which I'm sure many of you may be familiar with. And if not, it's good information to know. But um, this is kind of a good framework for that, but we're really talking about federal policy today. So um, elections, that's obviously getting people elected, putting people in power who have values that align with yours. Now, National Farmers School Network, nor um, NSAC, National Sustainable Ag Coalition, neither of us does election campaigning. So, and some, most of you may not, some of you may, but the point here is to advocate and get folks elected that really believe in what you believe in, um, to accomplish the same kinds of goals. The next piece is authorization. I think this is where a lot of the policy discussions that we have um, really come up and what we end up focusing on a lot, but um, it's about supporting or opposing bills depending on their purpose um, and those bills that eventually come law become laws a lot we spend a lot of time advocating around uh, 
<clears throat> and ensuring that they're accomplishing the goals that we have set forth and that they align with our mission and values. But um, again, authorization is an opportunity to support or oppose those bills. Bills can serve a variety of functions. So they can create or end programs. They can uh, make changes to them. It could be to start a pilot or provide new funding or uh, determine the type of funding, whether that's annual or mandatory, um, or it can make changes to the programs, et cetera. Uh, again, serving a variety of functions. So CNR, um, what we've been referring to is the child nutrition reauthorization. Um, reauthorization meaning that every five years actually for this particular bill it has to be reauthorized and repassed if you will but it's a package of bills that determines child nutrition programs so those are the national school lunch program the school breakfast program um, it includes the farm to school act and the grant program that lives in the USDA also programs like WIC after school and summer meals and other programs. Um, but that's what we'll be talking about today specifically, but um, that's just one authorized bill. Uh, the next piece is appropriations, which is kind of a whole other process of its own sometimes. So it, the point of it though, is to make sure that money goes where it's supposed to. So um, federally, when things aren't appropriated correctly or when you have the government shutdowns, that's when there's a halt in that process um, and that Congress isn't able to come to a full agreement on that. Um, and programs that require appropriations or require money in general tend to take a lot of advocacy um, and a lot of effort. A lot of times you'll hear from legislators, uh, it's not in the budget, or how do we make sure that this is budget neutral, or there's not a lot of money this year. And so literally every year there's not a lot of money is what we're told. So um, just keep that in mind that those are conversations you might run into when it comes to things like appropriations. Um, and additional money for federal programs can be obtained through appropriations processes. But ultimately that's about funding um, and that's the meat of that. And finally, implementation is what I wanted to add to the slide. So um, advocacy, advocacy doesn't stop when the bill passes or when the budget is approved. Uh, you, we have to be a part of making sure that the programs that we've advocated for are actually running effectively or that those funds are being used appropriately, that they're actually going out of the door um, and that the agencies that are taking that are supposed to receive them are using them um, in the ways that you know, we had originally advocated for. Um, additionally to implementation, there's an evaluation piece. Um, if that was written into the bill, making sure that the programs are evaluated so we know how well they work. Um, there's oversight that happens by legislators to make sure that folks are behaving basically and outreach to make sure that uh, if a program needs participants, if it's a grant that needs applications, that outreach is happening to reach those folks that are supposed to be applying, that should be applying, um, that need to be applying and need to be taking part in that process. So that was a very whirlwind run of policy. I just want to take a moment, make a little bit of space. Um, are there any questions about that? Oh. And if you have questions, you can share them um, via Q&A. And Lacey, if I'm not um, giving clear instructions on that, feel free to jump in. Nope, you've got it. Should, folks should see a, a Q&A or a chat box so that they can enter any of their questions and we'll address them. Great. So we'll give that um, just a moment, let you mull on that information. If there's anything you want to know about the policy process and how that works or um, you know, how, how you can engage in that. We'll obviously be talking about engagement uh, a little bit later in the presentation, but um, just wanted to set that kind of baseline understanding of it. All right, so I see no questions so far, but I'm gonna give that one more minute in case something is absolutely burning and you have finally mustered up the confidence to ask it. Um,
All right, so no questions so far, but please do, if you have anything that you're thinking about or have any questions, please do drop them in the Q&A box or the chat box. Um, we would love to hear and um, we would like to know. So uh, I have, well, it's not quite a question, but um, we do have folks that aren't necessarily allowed to lobby and that could be because you work in a government function or in a role and <clears throat> that's not in your purview or your organization doesn't allow that. Whatever the case may be, if you are not allowed to lobby, there are opportunities for you to educate lawmakers. So you may not be going with the direct um, legislative ask like, please support the Farm to School Act. That would be a lobbying act. Um, and this is a very simplified definition of lobbying. So please feel free to dig into that further. But um, if you aren't allowed to lobby, you can always educate policymakers and say, I would like to invite you to see the cafeteria at our school and how awesome our salad bar program is without making any asks. And that's a really great way to engage legislators is just providing them education, maybe it's a fact sheet, maybe you're going to visit and just talk about a program that you run and talk about how great it is. Maybe it's arranging a site visit, um, a variety of ways to engage uh, the folks who are making policy without actually doing lobbying activity. And we'll be happy to share more information about that offline if you're interested. But I'm going to jump into uh, the CNR portion. So again, CNR stands for the Child Nutrition Reauthorization. So a little bit of history about that. In 1964, it originally started uh, as a school lunch program, um, just the school lunch program, to boost the national security and make sure our kids grow up big and strong to join the military. So however you feel about that is uh, where it's at. But where we are today in 2010, um, nutrition, we, I'm sorry, I'm reading the slide. We're in 2019, folks. So where we are today, the program itself is dramatically different and serves a variety of purposes. And a lot of us tend to look at it as an anti-hunger measure. It's a, it's a health measure to make sure kids are healthy. It's an academic measure to make sure that they're learning. So uh, the school lunch and breakfast programs and those programs that occur outside of school, including WIC, um, which is serving mothers and families, these programs are really serving a variety of purposes and um, supporting our kids in a very different way. So uh, one thing to note here is that in 2010, a really big change happened with the, uh, with the Child Nutrition Reauthorization. And it was passed and it was called the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. And it uh, set nutrition standards that were not previously in existence for the program. Um, you'll hear about whole grains and sodium intake and sugar, those things were then legislated and uh, highly contested today. Uh, there's a lot of tension around those things. You'll hear about um, rollbacks of those standards, but those things happened in 2010 um, and schools have been working to implement those since then. Um, also, the Farm to School Grant Program was instituted in 2010 as part of that CNR package that passed. So that was a really exciting win for us as it provided $5 million mandatory funding, which is there no matter what, um, pending something crazy, but it's there every year available to be dispersed as farm to school grant funds um, to different organizations, which I imagine at least a few of you on the call have been able to uh, receive in the past years. So that was a big win for farm to school and we're really trying to expound on that and grow that win. Oops. Okay, so uh, some of the policy priorities that we're taking on um, in 2019, uh, is one of them, obviously, is the Farm to School Act of 2019. So um, in 2010, that bill passed, and we're bringing it back again to expand this program. So the proposed changes, and I'll just go through these fairly quickly, but the big things we're trying to do are increase annual funding from five to 15 million. As many of you may know, the demand for the Farm to School Grant Program is about four times higher than what's currently available. So um, we came to the number 15 after extensive, extensive discussions. And so that's what we'll be asking for this year. Um, we also want to increase participation from our beginning veteran and socially disadvantaged farmers as defined by the USDA. Um, and as part of our goal in advancing equity as an organization. Uh, we want to expand the program so that it, it more fully includes early care and education sites, summer and after school meal sites as well, because those aren't currently uh, captured in the language of the bill. We we'll want to increase access among tribal schools um, and tribal producers so that they're able to take part in this grant effectively. 
and excuse me, and in addition to raising the total amount of money available, we want to increase the grant cap from 100,000. Um, this is a typo, it's 250,000 is what we're proposing. Um, so that larger agencies can do bigger launches of their programs and really uh, make those institutionalized and have stronger starts that are more impactful in the long term. So that doesn't mean that you have to be applying for a 250,000 grant to receive it, but it just makes the options more viable for larger institutions that are serving uh, larger groups of children um, and to make sure that uh, more folks can participate in farmer school programs. So these changes, we really found them from feedback from you all. We've had listening sessions, we've had offhand conversations, we've had formal ones, conferences. Um, based on all the feedback from within the network, these are how we came up with these changes for this bill. So just know that your input is incredibly important and continues to inform our policy work um, because that's, we're doing that together. I'm going to go to the next slide here. Another priority that we're discussing is, um, not discussing, but actively advocating for, is geographic preference reform. So in 2008, the Farm Bill established a geographic preference option that would uh, really enhance schools' ability to procure locally. So um, we're not creating a new thing. There, there is such thing as geographic preference that exists for schools when they're doing their bidding for um, for food, but it's it's not very simple. Their uh, school administrators have told us that they have to use a lot of workarounds, and so basically we're looking to simplify that process and make it easier for them to say, "I want my apples from Washington if I live in Washington," or what we're not defining local for anyone, but to make that a simpler task to reduce the paperwork and reduce that administrative burden and help our farmers. So. We have one more slide here. So those are uh, bills that we're hoping to see added to that package of bills known as CNR. Um, and I'm going to shift a little bit from actual legislation to strategy now. Um, and I think Sarah will really dive into this in a really good way. But uh, one of the things behind the scenes that happens is committees are doing the work of drafting these bills. So um, if a bill comes up and it's like, we're going to do this thing, uh, the Congress has to decide who, what committee is gonna take this on and give the first shot at it. And so uh, the key committees here that are working on CNR, in the Senate, it's the Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition and Forestry. A lot of times you'll hear just them called Senate Ag or Senate Agriculture. In the House uh, of Representatives, it's the House Committee on Education and Labor. A lot of times we just refer to them as House Ed. So the members of those committees are really uh, drafting this bill um, and Mostly Congress depends on those committees to do a lot of that footwork and a lot of that um, heavy lifting of drafting the bill, figuring out what's in, what's out, and that's really where our, our advocacy is focused, is on these committees, on the members who are on these committees, and um, doing the work there. Uh, so if you have a member, um, if one of your representatives is on one of those committees, they are they can be a key influencer in the outcome of not only the geographic preference and promise school act, but in the uh, in in terms of the entire CNR, they can be a really influential piece to that. And so we look for co-sponsorship on the committee um, to have somebody in that room when those decisions are being made. Um, and if you don't know who your representative is, you uh, can certainly look them up on govtrack.us. It'll just pop in your address and you'll find out who that representative is if they're on that committee um, that's pertinent to this. Uh, we have a quick question I just want to address before we move on. Um, the detail, so Sunny asked, um, she, um, they would like to know the details of the plan to increase participation from beginning veteran and socially disadvantaged farmers. That's a really good question, Sunny, and I don't, um, I, I think we can go offline of this. I'm not dodging your question, but um, in the bill text itself without getting too, um, too into it, I don't want to go like full policy wonk here, but um, we have a couple lines in there and a couple lines can make a dif big difference just to be clear. Um, we have a couple of lines in there that really start to dig at um, the criteria for grant applications and reviewing them so that they're uh, making sure we get a diverse array of applications, that they are addressing the challenges that those particular farmers may face, and that um, 
that any application that's prioritizing the needs of those farmers, whether that be procuring from them or those farmers applying themselves, maybe as a cooperative group, um, that those applications are prioritized. So that's that's one way that we're doing that and being explicit about that and clear in the requirements um, for how the grants are evaluated. So uh, I hope that answers your question just to start, um, but I'm happy to follow up on that more. Um, if you wanted to see the bill text, I'm happy to share that as well. Um, with the caveat that it is still a little bit uh, in editing mode, so uh, things may change ever so slightly. But uh, yeah, if you have questions, feel free to keep adding them to the uh, the Q and A box, and we'll answer them as we go along. Um, now, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. So I went into more of the mechanics of how policy works, and I think she, not I think she will, <laughs> she will definitely be covering more of what the strategies are and how do we actually get things to happen. Right on. Thanks a bunch, Chloe. Awesome. So super happy to be talking to you guys today. And um, I got about 15 minutes of, of some, some, some big picture stuff and then some specifics about what you can do starting today and into the fall. And then again, we're going to make sure there's time for more questions and discussion before we wrap up. Um, but first, just to, to start at the big picture level, why does my advocacy even matter here? Why are we you know, why do we need to be talking to farm, about farm to school? Isn't it just a given that it's awesome? Uh, so before I worked in Washington, I worked in the field. I was a nonprofit person doing stuff in the field. I was at farmer's markets. I was at farmer meetings. I was at community meetings. I was doing education. I was doing all the work in the field. Um, I didn't think a whole lot about Congress's role in our food system, except that, you know, I knew that sometimes policy created barriers to the things we wanted to do. And I knew that, Sometimes I applied for grants from USDA and it was really awesome when we had access to federal dollars to support our work. But what I didn't know for a long time was that those programs like the Farm to School Grant Program that were available to help support the work that my community was doing, that those weren't there just out of the, the goodness of the heart of members of Congress. They were there because folks in the field asked for them and advocated for them and continued to work to protect and improve them. Um, they were there for that reason and for that hard grassroots work. So when it comes to big bills like child nutrition, there's a ton of important issues at stake. All of them are important and meaningful and have a chance to impact people's real lives. So why does it matter? It matters because we want to make sure that these issues that we care about, they're on the table, they're being discussed, and are, we don't miss on a really critical opportunity to advance our work um, and increase the resources and support available for all that we do in the field. And just a little bit of real talk from our perspective here in DC, I can tell you for certain that um, if you aren't speaking up, uh, someone else is all too happy to speak for you here in DC. And we really don't wanna miss on a chance for all of you to be heard and have your chance to speak up for what matters to you in whatever way makes the most sense for you. Um, I'll also just mention, you know, I don't want to imply for the next little bit that policy is the only way to do this work. Um, we know that policy is just a piece. You know, Chloe kind of outlined all the functions of NFSN and the network. You are, pro you are all doing outstanding work in the field. Um, policy is just one tool that we have in our toolkit to help build that better future that we're trying to build, which includes farm to school. So with that, let's get into some specifics about how we get there. First, just to put it in extra big font uh, to make it extra super big and clear. How do we ensure that the farm to school funding, the policy improvements, um, the procurement improvements that we've just spent some time talking about, how do we make sure that those are a part of the final Child Nutrition Act? It sounds really simple, but this is what we've got to do. We've got to raise awareness of those issues and why they matter and how they impact real people, real farmers, real communities. And then from that, we've got to build support in Congress for them, for Farm to School and all the ways it helps kids, communities, and farmers. Members of Congress, they care about kids, they care about farmers, um, but where they need our help and where we have a role, all of us, um, is to help them understand just how they can help to make it really specific. Um, and raising that awareness and building that support is what that's all about. So let's get in. I'm going to get into now. I'm going to shift into some more nuts and bolts of kind of what that might look like sort of in the field and in your daily work. So and these are we're going to start with how do we work to raise farm to school awareness? Um, you know, just up front, 
the work that you do every day is already raising awareness. Like you are already doing this. And so first, thank you for what you're already doing and for the stories you're already sharing and the impact that you're already having. Um, but again, like I mentioned, the larger sort of national discussion about child nutrition is beginning, which means members of Congress are listening, they're paying attention, they're trying to feel out what are the key issues? What do I, as a lawmaker, need to pay attention to? And it's our job to make sure that Farm to School and all the component policies that we've just talked about are part of that dialogue. Um, so we need to educate them. Here's some ideas, just some ideas to get your brain going, to get your inspiration going on how you might have a role here. Um, starting with social media, I would imagine that many, if not most of you, make good use of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and talking about who you are and what you do. When's the last time you talked about your farm to school efforts uh, on your social media channels? If you do it all the time and you say, oh, I do that every day, maybe consider sharing some specific success stories that have a policy component. Maybe it's you received a grant through the farm to school grant program. Maybe there's another solution there. And even better, tagging your congressional lawmakers to ensure they see that post and they have a chance to see it and engage with it. Um, consider press outreach. Do you work with a local newspaper or a TV station? Maybe you've gotten some great coverage of the awesome things that you're doing in the past. We would love to work with you on some opportunities to encourage the media to cover your work, your school, your community, your procurement projects, or share past good coverage you've gotten with congressional offices. That's where our role in DC can help. We can partner with you on that. Develop a case study. If you've had an experience or a project that you think was especially successful, we would super love to talk to you about maybe turning that into a case study that we could share on our blog, on our website, maybe even in a congressional meeting. And then finally, and some of you I think on the phone um, or webinar today may have, have already done this in the past, I recognize some familiar names on the list, consider inviting your congressional lawmakers on a site tour. Um, do you have beautiful school gardens that you would love to show off, um, recognizing that for all of us in different regions, the timing of the growing season and the school's year don't always align perfectly for a tour, but maybe your gardens are going to be kicking in August, and maybe you have some folks maintaining them through the summer, maybe you have summer programs. Have you considered inviting your lawmakers out to see the cool work that you're doing? Um, even if your lawmaker is unable to attend, even if they say, thanks for the invite, we just can't make it. You know what you've done in inviting them is you've put, in your work on, you've put your work on their radar and you've helped build awareness even if they aren't able to come out. If they're able to come out, all the better. There is no way to see, there's no better way to see the impact of what you do than for someone to see it with their own eyes and in person. So a couple, a couple ideas there that are awareness raising. Um, and just a note, Chloe mentioned, you know, I know that not everyone on the call may be able fully to do what we consider advocacy, so making a specific ask of a lawmaker. Raising awareness everyone can do, education everyone can do. If you're just doing education, if you're just helping folks be aware of the importance of the work and the programs, you can do that without advocacy and you can do that safely. If you have questions about that, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. What's the timeline for this kind of action? It can start yesterday, it can start now. You can be doing any and all of these things um, starting this very minute. Um, if you have timeline questions or if you wanna partner with us on a site tour or a case study or something else, anytime this summer into the fall is gonna be a great time for awareness raising. And I'll just mention again, um, if you haven't yet pulled up the links to those two committees that Chloe mentioned that are very, very key, um, just to emphasize that every member of Congress should this bill move forward, we'll eventually have a chance to take a vote on the final Child Nutrition Act package. However, I wanna emphasize again, um, if you haven't taken a look at those committee lists, uh, I would strongly encourage everybody to make that a specific follow-up today. If one of your representatives or senators in Congress is on one of those key committees, you have an extra special role and responsibility to help on awareness building because that person, that lawmaker, is gonna carry a really outsized role moving this bill forward. So let's shift a little bit from awareness into building support. So this is taking, hey, this is some good news. We wanna share some cool successes and opportunities and needs with you, you know, on both sides of the coin, what we're doing well and what we need. Let's turn that into an express ask for support. This is when we make the shift 
and just to know that when we're asking for support from members of Congress, that is considered advocacy. So if you, again, if you need guidance on where those lines fall for your own organization, we would be super glad to follow up with you offline and make sure that everything is, is all good there. But let's talk about building support. Awareness is great, but it's only a piece. Um, when, after we have built that awareness and they've, your member of Congress has said, this is amazing. I love this work. How can I support it? You have answers for them. And the answers are, first and foremost, for the next couple of months, um, starting hopefully in a few weeks, when those marker bills or those idea bills that Chloe walked us through, when those bills have been introduced in Congress, we're going to ask a couple of things. We'll first ask you to consider endorsing them. So you'll have an opportunity, it's a simple Google form, takes about 30 seconds, to consider endorsing the bill from on behalf of your organization or you as an individual. And then in turn, we encourage you as well to consider asking your partners, local leaders, anybody you work with in any kind of farm to school efforts to consider endorsing the bills as well. Um, putting together a strong endorsement list, um, the last time we went through a CNR cycle, we had, oh, uh, I think over 800 organizations nationwide endorsed one of our bills. It matters. Members of Congress look to that and they say, oh, well, is this organization I trust in my community endorsing the bill? They are? Great. That helps, that helps convince them to support it as well. Then the next thing we can, we'll ask you to do, and again, this is all kind of timeline coming a little later this summer, is we'll ask you to in turn ask your lawmakers to co-sponsor those marker bills. So once they've been introduced, any member in Congress can co-sponsor those bills. And a co-sponsor is simply a way of saying, I signal my support, I put my name on it. That helps a lot because then when the committee goes to write the bill, if there are a bunch of lawmakers who have already endorsed that bill, it makes it a whole lot easier to make sure it's in the final package. It's just a way, it's again, it's about building support. And the way you do that is really simple. It can be a 30 second phone call, a five minute email, um, we will have a whole bunch of instructions and guidance and sample materials for you when our bills are introduced to help you take that really simple step of reaching out to your congressional delegation and encouraging them to consider co-sponsoring the bills. And again, just another reminder, um, if you haven't done it, I super strongly encourage, again, if you haven't looked up those committee lists, they're really important. If you have committee members, they again have an outsized influence, so it'll be extra of value to ask those folks to consider co-sponsoring the bills um, and supporting getting them in to the final child nutrition package. And then I think I have one more slide and then I'm gonna hand it back to Chloe. So just really briefly, um, where do we go from here? I wanted to put a couple of kind of follow-ups and next steps on where things go from here. So first and foremost, um, you can be raising awareness of the value of farm to school in all of its component parts, in school gardens, in procurement, in opening up access to um, historically marginalized communities of farmers, in how farm to school connects to rural development, to economic development, to jobs, to farmers, to racial equity. However you do this work, you can be raising awareness starting now. Um, and that can be as simple as social media post, that can be a blog post, that can be however you envision it. Now is a great time. And connecting, again, connecting that awareness raising back to Congress. Now is the chance, not just for the public, but to help make sure Congress knows what's going on. Um, that can be now, and that's good all throughout the year. Um, there will be very specific action opportunities on the build support side for Farm to School in Congress in the next few weeks. I'll encourage you to look for updates from both of our two organizations very soon. We're working on a congressional timeline right now. So as soon as those bills are introduced, the opportunities for you to endorse them, for you to encourage others to endorse them, and for you to ask your members of Congress to co-sponsor them will all come online, hopefully in the next few weeks. And again, know that we, we, will, we will be moving on those just the minute we possibly get the okay from our friends in Congress. And then finally, this won't be the last chance or the only opportunity to learn about this work and to get involved. This is kind of your preview, your trending topic, your like early insider intel. Um, there will be plenty of chances between now into the fall, maybe even into next year, to talk more on webinars, to be a part of more discussions, um, to link in Farm to School Month, and to just make this an ongoing effort that we work together on throughout the rest of the year and maybe beyond. And I, with that, I will hand it back to Chloe. 
Thank you. So um, I do want to reiterate a point that Sarah made about, um, you know, this advocacy can start at any time, really. And that's true. And it doesn't have to happen just just when there's a bill or just when there's legislation out there. But this is, you know, you want to continue building champions in your legislators and show them, you know, I don't just need you around this time of year, but um, continue having those conversations with them, even if you don't have a specific legislative ask. So um, just maintaining those relationships so that they're ready and raring to go when it is time to ask for a bill or a budget ask. <clears throat> so with that being said, uh, we have a good chunk of time now allotted for questions specifically. So um, I wanted to start with, we have one in the Q&A box and please just shoot them at us. We're happy to answer anything that we can or whatever's on your mind right now. Um, but we have a, one question from Krista here. Are there any plans to help support dairy farmers? And from the NFSN side, I will say we don't have any specific plans outlined um, related to dairy farming. And that's not because we don't care about dairy farmers. Um, it's really we're focusing our energy on the Farm to School Act. There are only two policy folks in DC right now. So um, there's the challenge there just with capacity. But um, also, we want to continue having conversations with folks who are in dairy um, with those farmers. We know there's a lot of challenges in that industry right now, especially for agriculture work. So um, if you want to connect, I'm happy to and we can discuss, you know, what it is the network that could be doing to help there. And if that if we have a good role in that and who we can support um, that aligns with our values too. So, uh, Chris, I hope that answers your question. Uh, we have another question from G uh, Jan here. Sorry, I wasn't close enough to the monitor. Uh, maybe I already said this. Can you send all the links after the webinar that direct us to the Congressional Committee? Absolutely. Um, we definitely can. And I'll just pop back over. Box. Yeah, we can. Uh, actually, can we put that in the chat box? I think we can. Well, I don't know what's going on. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I don't know how to do this, <laughs> but I, we will send the links out. We can make sure to send those in a follow-up email. Um, in the meantime, I'll go back to that slide. Um, I don't know what I just did. Uh, if we, if just keep sending questions while I figure out what I just did to myself. Oh, well, I don't know what that was, but um, I'll go back to that slide with those links. Um, and again, these are two, uh, Senate Ag Committee, House Ed and Education and Labor, and How to Find Your Representative Online. So we'll follow up on that. Uh, Krista, yes, let's definitely uh, follow up. Um, you can either shoot me an email or I could shoot you one and we'll talk more. So. We'll give you, we, like I said, we have plenty of time for questions. We'd love to discuss. Um, you can cheat the chat box too by just adding a comment if you wanted to share a comment. It doesn't filter out non-question mark <laughs> statements. So um, one question we have for you all is what, um, are there other pri priorities, excuse me, a little tongue tied, with, within CNR that you're working on? So any child nutrition policies that either you'd like to see worked on, um, so like Krista mentioned, wanting to see dairy uplifted more, but um, uh, so any policies that you wanna see highlighted or if you have any questions about what's currently being worked on or if you have some specific things that you are working on. So. Yeah, let's just talk policy priorities in CNR. And you can enter those, you, you aren't allowed to use your mic for this particular webinar, but you can enter those into the chat box and we'd love to shout them out. And if you have any questions about how to go about those campaigns or developing them, we'd love to address them. But let us know what you're doing out there.
I see we have a question. Do you see some states adding more foundational groundwork to the farm to school pillars leading the way in ECE? And if so, who is leading the way in your opinion? Um, and that's from Todd. So Todd, that's a very, very good question. I might, I, Lacey, I know that you did not sign up for this, but <laughs> I might pass that on to you. Um, I don't have all the knowledge in the world about what who's leading the way in farm to school and farm to ECE. Um, and I don't have all the context for that, but I think Lacey, you might be able to speak to that. And if not, we would love to follow up. But I will say one really great resource, and uh, we can send this out in the follow-up email, but um, uh, is online at farmtoschool.org on our website. You'll find our 2002, or our most recent a uh, farm to school state legislative handbook. I hope I said that in the right, uh, just right order, but you can find it on our resources page. And I think it'll give you a lot of good information about what's happened. Not I think, it definitely will give you a lot of good information policy-wise, what's happening at the state level, um, and who's really charging forward with farm to school policy, and some uh, strong examples of farm to ECE policy, whether it's working or whether it's not, and that'll be noted. So that's a resource for you to definitely take advantage of. But Lacey, do you have any thoughts on this question? I'm not sure if you can see it either, but. Sure, yeah, Chloe, I can chime in. Um, and speaking to state level policy specifically, I think our gold standard around farm to early care and education state policy is the Healthy Tots Act in Washington, D.C., um, which allowed opportunity for increased local reimbursement, um, as well as funding for uh, grant programs within, many grant programs within EC settings and set uh, some standards, nutrition and health standards for early care and education settings. So um, that's really kind of the, the premier first and um, kind of standard around farm to early care and education um, policy at the legislative le level. We've also just very recently, Minnesota passed some farm to school slash ECE legislation that is fully inclusive of both K, th K through 12 and ECE. So that's an important trend we're seeing is that when state level folks are advocating for farm to school policy in general, that we're inclusive of early care and education in that. Um, and so that's an exciting advance for a lot of states working on the um, legislative realm. I think another kind of advance that we see um, in farm to early care and education policy is a little bit outside that legislative piece, but looking at opportunities to leverage um, other uh, more administrative policy. So thinking about um, you know, quality rating and improvement systems and licensing systems and how to leverage and align farm to early care and education with those systems. And we've seen some advances with that in Colorado and Wisconsin, for instance. Um, so I'd be happy, Todd, to talk further about farm to early care and education policy and, and leveraging those within states as well and some key, key uh, factors for success. Thanks so much, Lacey. I appreciate that. Um, so Todd, I hope that's helpful information. Again, please do follow up with us if you want to know more. Um, but like I said, that resource in the farm to school um, state, oh, I did not mean to click this link, the state farm to school legislative handbook, uh, that'll be helpful as well. But thank you again, Lacey, for highlighting that. And here's our emails too at the end if you want to reach out to us. Um, from Akara, I see this is a recording. You are correct. We are recording. Uh, Lacey, just I don't want to make any over promises, but we will send the link out to the recording uh, after in the follow up email. We will. We'll send the link out along with. Um uh, links to all the resources that our speakers mentioned, um, including the reports and the policy reports that Chloe mentioned as well. Right on. Well, thank you guys so much for all your questions. I'll just say we're, we're on here for a few more minutes. So if you have other issues or ideas or policy concerns around child nutrition that you've been hearing about in your community or maybe in other coalition or discussion spaces, we'd love to hear about it. Um, feel free to drop it in the chat box. That'll help us make sure going forward that we're listening to and accounting for the needs and the ideas out in the field. So please feel free to share with us if there's other pieces that are popping in your mind in your community right now. 
platform. Um, oh, we have a couple more questions. They're in a different chat box for some reason. Oh, um, all right. <laughs> learning how this works. <laughs> so um, from Trista, this is just a, a fun tip. So inviting state and federal senators and delegates to your farm to school network meetings. So it mm -hmm. um, sounds like if you're going to uh, any farm to school conferences, if you're hosting them to invite those legislators um, and it could be just to attend, it could be for their staff to attend, it could be for them to speak. I've been at um, a few of those. So it's a really great way to get them out front and uh, let folks see them and acknowledge them when they do get there too. So thanks for that suggestion, Trista. Trista, excuse me. Uh, another question from Sunny. Do you have any kind of timeline you can let us in on regarding CNR? Well, uh, <laughs> that's a great question. And I wish we did. I really wish that I had like some secret answer from behind closed smoky doors, but we really, we don't have a very clear idea of the timeline and that's something that we're asking about almost every day at this point so um what we know from the senate is that they do want to do it um they do want to do it before the end of the year um we had originally heard rumblings of it happening in june but we're at june and we have confirmed that it's definitely not going to drop right now but um we're told that we want they want it to happen this year as far as the house um we we don't know uh there hasn't been any clear timeline set forth i i we don't know that it's really their top priority at this moment in time so the more we know is when we'll share with you all so it but don't be alarmed it's not a secret that the, the verdict is just not out yet as to when what will happen and whatnot like that so i feel like that was a little rambly but yeah i mean the, yeah the short version short version is um could move as early as this summer um could bleed into the fall uh could even creep a little bit into next year but we really don't know and and i don't think that anyone actually knows yeah <laughs> um we'll totally kind of see what happens but the, the one thing we do know is that the wheels are going to begin turning on marker bills and the sort of broader dialogue and discourse here in DC and nationally, those are in motion and going to kick into higher gear in the next few weeks. And Sarah, could you talk a little about, about what a marker bill is? I, I didn't mention that earlier. I feel like I should have. Sure. Yeah. Just a little reminder for anybody who's thinking, well, wait, what's a marker bill? Um, we talked about two bills, right? The Farm to School Act and the as yet untitled geographic preference marker bill. Um, what's a marker bill? A marker bill is essentially an ideas package. It's a set. It's a real bill. It has a real name. It's filed in the congressional record, just like anything else. Um, but the key distinction is there's never going to be a floor vote on the Farm to School Act. It's not going to be a standalone bill that marches its solo way through the halls of Congress. It's intended to be bundled into a larger package like the Child Nutrition Act. They, um, you don't have to do a marker bill to share an idea with Congress. Um, members of Congress use them. They introduce them. Champions, uh, legislators themselves introduce them as a way to signal their support for issues um, and to build support. Again, kind of what I mentioned earlier. They're organizing tools for members of Congress and for us in the field to help show how strong support is for a certain set of issues and help get them included in a bigger package so they can hitch a ride. <laughs> I like that. So um, we're carpooling on legislation right now. With the Farm <laughs> <School Act. laughs> uh, so I, I would love to capture any other, um, oh, someone sent an article. Oh, I guess you can see my screen as I look at it. <laughs> but, oh, this is from March. Yes, uh, this is a really, this is a good article to share. Uh, Child Nutrition does move forward. So this was announced by the chair of the Senate Agriculture Committee back in January. So um, if you want to get a little bit more information, this looks like a pretty good article. It is an opinion article. Um, I'm not endorsing it. I'm just sharing it. Um, but uh, if you want to learn more, there's some good stuff in here. Growing Healthy Next Generation, the President's 2020 Budget Proposal, uh, things like that. So Todd, to answer your question, um, this, is, this is a few months back where folks would have been saying, we're going to do this reauthorization in June. And so things have shifted a bit since then. So um, if you hear anything else about CNR that we haven't heard yet, please do share. We, we really, if you have any inside tips, if you are secretly a staffer, feel free to chat with us. We would love to talk. But um, like uh, Sarah said, we, we don't exactly know when it's going to happen, but uh, 
that it may. So with that said, are there any other questions um, that are burning in your spirit? Oh, we have one more. Can you describe, uh, this is from Sarah, can you describe how the Farm to School Act will increase access among tribal schools and increase traditional foods from tribal producers? So uh, really great question, Sarah. And Again, this is this is directly from the bill text, but we have a provision in there, um, and I don't want to go too deep into it because it does. It's hard for me to explain necessarily, but um, basically making sure that uh, tribal organizations can access the bill um, that is accessible to them. So there, we our understanding and feedback, and we're still talking about this with folks who represent those organizations. But uh, the bill, the the fun. I'm sorry, let me back this up. The grant program was dis difficult to apply to because sometimes uh, tribal organizations wouldn't be eligible for it based on this matching process where, um, from my understanding, where tribal organizations may already be getting a large amount from federal funding, you have to have a non-federal funds match to the grant program. And so we've written in some language because tribal organizations do operate under a different set of laws and so they're, uh, they interact with the federal government differently than um, folks who are not uh, uh, tribally related. So we basically wrote the legislation so that they would be able to access the grant program more easily so that, uh, you know, this factor that's not really in their control wasn't prohibiting them from participating. So that's, I think, maybe the simplest explanation I can give in the next minute and a half. But if you have more questions, I'm happy to dive neck deep into it with you. Um, and again, it's something that we are soliciting more feedback from uh, folks who are representing tribal organizations. So we don't want to jar any assumptions, but we have had those conversations and we're continuing them. So um, if you have more questions, feel free to drop them in. We just have a couple of minutes left. Uh, so I'm going to give some space to capture any questions that may happen there. All right, folks, so seeing no more questions, um, that's not to say don't ever ask another question again. Feel free to email myself or Sarah with anything that's um, on your mind. Um, but seeing no more questions right now, uh, we will go ahead and end this webinar. So um, thank you again for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Appreciate the questions and the feedback, and we hope that this was a moment for learning for all of you. And if there's anything you want to see in the future, if there was something that you want to follow up on again, do shoot us an email, and we'll be happy to get back with you. And uh, stay tuned for future trending topics webinars and other webinars offered by the National Farm School Network and National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. Everybody, uh, thanks and have a great afternoon. Thank you.